call the squat the king of exercises. But it's more than that. It's the first exercise you ever did, and nobody taught you how. You invented it. We all did, even though we didn't know it had a name. Some of us stop squatting as we grow up. Others put immense loads on their backs and squat to break records or to build superhuman legs. At its best, the motion is the same as when you were a child. You sit down, then you stand back up. As an exercise, the squat predates bodybuilding, powerlifting, and even Olympic weightlifting. Its roots stretch back into the days when weight training was the domain of professional strongmen who performed incredible feats in front of wide-eyed audiences. You know, I started when I was very young, and I had been around the sport my entire life. But I got away from it for a long time. I went into bodybuilding for a while, and then I got into powerlifting for a while, and then I came back to weightlifting. And I think the reason why um, I've had success as a coach is because I've asked a lot of questions and I've learned a lot over the years. Generally, when you get stronger in the squat, it makes your entire organism stronger. And I've proven time and time again that just when you're physically stronger in the squat, everything will increase. Your arms will gain size, your chest will get bigger, your bench press will go up. Everything gets stronger because your organism as an entire whole is stronger. So in the past, I've researched uh, the history of the actual squat as an exercise. And I went back as far as the modern day Olympics in 1896 and I found that it actually predated that. So I started looking to um, old circus performers or old time strongmen to try to find out, you know, how it started. What I found was you hear names like uh, Arthur Saxon or Louis Sear, other strongmen from the past. As I researched it further, I found out that it came from a guy and he's referred to as the professor Louis Attila. And one of his students was a guy named Eugene Sandow. He became very popular, not just because of his strength, but because of how he looked. And ultimately, he became the first bodybuilder. In 1901, he held a competition for bodybuilding. The reason I bring him up is because he had a book that he wrote in 1894, and it was a physical culture of training. And in one of his exercises, he clearly describes what's known as a squat and used that exercise. And so I believe that Attila was his coach and taught him how to do it. So I believe that the professor was the guy who actually invented the squat as an exercise. Sandow's worldwide fame for his strength, and just as importantly, his physique, inspired countless young men and women to follow in his footsteps. But unlike his immense bent presses and other unique lifts, his version of the squat was a light one done with small dumbbells. It took another 30 years for someone to push the upper limits of what could be squatted with a heavy barbell. The reason was simple. How would they get it on their back? The way that they would squat in the past, there was no apparatus, you know, to, there was no rack. And all the barbells back then were shot loaded, which means that it was a globe type barbell that was a fixed diameter and a fixed size. And to make it heavier, they would just pour shot inside the globe. So they were able to take that barbell and just stand it up on its long end and then grab the barbell and tilt it and catch it on their back and then do a squat and then set it back down. You know, and this is how they squatted back then. Same way when they did a one-arm bent press. They would load it on their shoulder, lean to one side and press. In the 1920s, Henry Steinborn earned a name for himself by squatting more than 500 pounds for five reps with a barbell that he tipped over onto his back. With triumphs like his and the increasing popularity of squatting for training in the Olympic lifts of the snatch and clean and jerk, the stage was set for the squat to take its place among the great exercises. Those guys back then were more interested in just becoming badasses. Like, what can I do to challenge myself? It was a different mindset. They weren't doing it because they wanted to look a certain way. They were doing it because they just wanted to be strong. So they would say, how much can I put over my head with one hand? How much can I do with two hands anyhow? I mean, the sport of weightlifting um, was revived in 1896 with the modern Olympics. And they had the one hand and the two hand lift. And after that, you still had the strong men and you know, the circus performers doing their thing. But as the Olympic movements gained traction, more people started training with weights and they wanted to compete at that high level and they became having world championships again. And so when people were doing snatch and clean and jerks, they found that they would start doing squats as assistant exercises until it evolved to where you had in the 1950s when guys like Paul Anderson you know, showed up. Mm -hmm. 
Anderson, a gold medal winning Olympic lifter and strongman, popularized the barbell squat as a standalone lift by putting up unheard of numbers. His personal best squat was a monstrous 1,200 pounds. His best official squat was 930 pounds in 1965. He trained relentlessly, squatting tractor wheels and 55 gallon drums from a hole in the ground. His accomplishments made him a celebrity whose name was synonymous with strength. That's pretty much how it started to change because, you know, the people saw how powerful he was and people like him from being immense squatters. And that's pretty much what changed when people saw, like, how much core strength they had. You know, they started becoming more mainstream. People wanted to look like these guys, and that was available through mail order. They could order York barbells and plates and racks, and things started to spread. And this is how it started to transition. As people started becoming more aware of what they're doing. And this is how things started to build, where people could grow, is because the information was now available, and so was equipment. And just like now, here we are in the modern day, where the internet's so accessible, you can get anything you want very quickly. The magazines, and back then, through that era, was what helped spread the word, and people could start to see how it was growing. By the 1960s, squatting had become mainstream. People could order racks and barbells through the mail and read in magazines about how to squat to increase strength and build better physiques. But in the 1970s, a new generation of bodybuilders and powerlifters redefined what was possible by using the squat for leg development. So really the first person that I saw that had just a straight freaky squat was Tom Platts. So Tom Platts and Franco Colombo were really the two uh, people that I actually watched or read about to really had good squats that were strong and also could do for reps. So that comes from mostly golden era bodybuilding. So that's really early on in my career who I kind of look to from a squat standpoint. Tom Platts was a guy that when I first saw his legs when I was a kid, I was just, I was blown away. Like he really changed the game for me. Like that was one of the things that was real impressive. And but just seeing his physique and his legs, I mean, it just blew my mind. Athletes like Platts, Anderson, Steinborn, and Sandow showed the world the possibilities of the human body. They made squatting look easy, even under weights that should have broken them. Together, they helped cement what has become one of the cardinal rules of strength training. If you want to be big and strong, you need to get under the barbell and squat 